Uh, this um, is real quite an honor to be here, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a real pleasure to me. And um, it's my first time professionally uh, visiting um, not only Aarhus, but the Denmark as a whole. And um, as you can see by both my name and my, my region, I, I obviously have some sort of Scandinavian connection. Uh, if, if actually, if you're not familiar, Wisconsin was settled by uh, Scandinavians um, back um, in, in the day after they kicked the, the natives out. But um, <laughs> um, today, um, uh, so, so this, this is um, and the, the great center of, of time series and econometric research in Scandinavia is right here in Aarhus in the Creates uh, group. And so it's a real quite a pleasure to be here. And, um, so what, what am I talking about today is, is, is averaging because I'm, I'm an average type of guy. Um, <laughs> the, um, so what, what's, what's, what's the, 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 this is some work I've been doing for a while and, and so I'm really talking about model averaging in, in my research. <laughs> That's the overview here. But um, the, the idea is that as an economist or an econometrician, you don't have just one model. You may have uh, multiple models. And they can, this would come, arise for a variety of reasons. You could have multiple theories that um, are competing uh, c competitors that you want to think about using. You could have different specifications of the model. It could have to do with nonlinearities, which variables. In time series, it can do with the lag structure. Um, you could have different regressors that you may or may not be including in the model, um, different polynomial orders or series expansions uh, that can come up. And then the, the question arises naturally, well, which model should I use? That's the way typically people see it. And in fact, if you look at a standard economic publication, it's a rare publication, the real rare publication, that acknowledges that there's only one specification. They only estimate one specification, and they never uh, talk about this. In fact, most papers have uh, tables which have different columns, each corresponding to a different specification. And then there's some chatty talk about why they, the different columns are interesting or different or useful. And, and so people acknowledge that there's multiple specifications, typically. And, um, but often the, the discussion about which model to use is informal or formal based on testing. Um, testing has to do with scientific questions about um, can I accept a hypothesis or reject a hypothesis. It doesn't tell you what is a good model to use in practice. Now, oftentimes people have this metaphor that I should be using the true model. A lot of people keep using that phrase, let's find the true model. I think that's silly. Truth has nothing to do with it. Because none of these models are true. And this goes back to uh, my former colleague George uh, Box who said that all models are approximations, but some are more useful than others. And the, the concept really in practice is that all the models are lenses by which we view the world, but we want to think about which one's a good approximation. And one way to see this is a really, really stylized, simple example. Um, take this simple location model that there's an unknown mean for y. And then you can have two estimators of the mean. You can have the sample mean, kind of the standard estimator, the MLE under normality, or you can have the silly estimator, zero. It sounds silly, but it's actually not an unreasonable estimate in many contexts, just to use the best guess you have. And zero is not really essential, it could be any number. And um, the mean square error of those two estimators are simply sigma squared over n and mu squared. And so that tells you that you, you should pick one or the, uh, the other depending if mu squared is bigger than sigma squared over n. But that's kind of silly, you don't know what mu squared is. But it tells you still that um, it, you don't really know which is the best estimator. It depends on the tr unknown truth. So if you're trying to minimize the mean square error, you'd want to pick one or the other based on this unknown thing. But then, of course, you could say, well, that's kind of silly because um, the, the simple estimator is not very, very useful. But let's th think about another estimator, which is an averaging estimator. I'm going to average the sample mean mu hat and the silly estimator mu tilde, where the weight is the simple number, 1 minus the num number of parameters I'm estimating, p, minus 2, divided by the kind of chi-square test uh, for the mean, uh, y bar prime y bar. That estimator is better than either of the other two. It's 
better than the silly estimator in the sense it has bounded risk, and it's better than the standard sample mean in that it has uniformly smaller mean square error regardless of the true value of mu. It's simply a better estimator in terms of mean square error. And that actually is not an original idea. It goes back to 1960, uh, James and Stein. So you can do better than a sample mean by taking averages of standard estimators and other estimators. Now, the mu tilde, the, the one calling tilde, is not really that crazy an estimator, simply a restricted estimator. We always ask, think about models with restrictions. That is, happens to be a model with the restriction that the mean is zero, but in general. This also relates to the concept of forecast combination. So oftentimes people get a little bit uncomfortable with model combination for general estimation problems, but it seems very natural when it comes down to forecasting because we don't really care so much about the model that gave rise to the forecast. We only care about what the forecast is. And I think the original articulation of the concept of uh, combination is um, an idea that uh, is due to uh, Bates and Granger in a famous paper from 1969. And their idea is, suppose you have a collection of forecasts, or forecasting models, really the same idea. What should you do? Should you pick one or should you pick the other? What should you report? And they said, no, don't think of it that way. Think about combination. You have all these forecasts, don't throw them away, use them all. But how am I going to use them? We're going to take the average. But should, should we do a simple average or should I do a weighted average? Well, weighted average seems like the most general idea. So do a weighted average of the forecast. And they said, well, it's pretty obvious that a weighted, for, weighted forecast can do better than using any individual forecast. The only trick is how do I pick the weights? They then had, so this was the first great intellectual breakthrough that said a weighted average has the potential to do better. The second breakthrough was said the intellectual way to think about this is to think about mean square error that the mean square error or the risk of the estimator is a way to sh cut through the, the, the complicated question of how to pick the weights and say, there's a methodology. Find the weights that minimize the mean square error. The third intellectual breakthrough they had was, let's find a particular algorithm to pick the weights, which is, let's assume that the forecasts are uncorrelated. And if the forecasts are uncorrelated, then it's easy to compute that the optimal weights are inverses of the variances of the individual forecasts, and that gives a particular um, weighting rule. That third intellectual contribution is not as great as the first two because it's kind of silly, assuming that the forecasts are uncorrelated. It gave rise to a particular rule, which is called the Bates-Granger forecast combination rule, but I think it's the first two ideas which were the great intellectual contribution. First, that combination gives you the potential to do better. Second, mean square error is the guiding light by which we can solve the problem. Um, I almost had a title about um, big data, apparently, for me, but they switched it. But, um, so everyone talks these days about big data. No one talks about small data anymore. Connected to that is something called machine learning. I have no, have no idea what machine learning is, but I keep hearing people talk about it. And wh what is um, machine learning? Well, I think the way econometricians like to think of it is the way uh, Hal White told us to think about neural nets. That is, it's a fancy new buzzword for fancy new non-parametric methods. And um, essentially that you're trying to estimate something like a conditional mean by lots and lots of regressors. You throw it into some algorithm. You have no idea what it does. It spits out uh, forecasts. <laughs> So essentially, we can think of it as high dimensional, a computer intensive work, pattern match, and, but it's a prediction oriented methodology uh, suited for cross section rather than time series data. But these machine learning um, methods, like non parametric methods in general, depend on tuning parameters, bandwidths, uh, these kind of things. How do you select these in practice in the statistics literature? Cross validation. So that's what they typically recommend for picking the um, tuning parameters for a lot of the machine learning techniques that links it up with non-parametrics and standard methods. The, a particular uh, modern machine learning method that's making the rounds is called ensemble methods. And ensemble methods are weighted average of other of, um, machine learning methods. That is precisely forecast combination. Ensemble methods of machine learning is um, 
what we called forecast combination econometrics back in 1969. Um, of course, you have to pick the ensemble weights. The modern technique is cross-validation. That is something that Jeff Forsina and I called jackknife model averaging um, or cross-validation weight selection a number of years ago. So it's all wrapped together that um, forecast combination, non-parametrics, cross-validation, machine learning, all these things are similar. What I want to talk about for the rest of the time is to get a little bit more specific of, than the broad concept of, of combination and talk about a research, research project I've been focusing on, on vector autoregressions, kind of linking in with the time series that a lot of people here um, it creates. It's a particular paper I've been working on. It's called, I've called Stein Combination Shrinkage for Bars. It's still work in progress. Um, the title may well change. And the paper focuses on two issues, impulse responses and forecasts. I'm going to focus on impulse responses because you get the more exciting results with impulse responses. In uh, as a vector autoregression, the standard format is you have m variables and p lags. And it's kind of a workhorse model in applied economics and used for multi-step forecasting and impulse responses. But the main idea here isn't really specific to impulse responses. It's just to any time you have a parameter you're trying to estimate. That's complicated. Um, one of the problems that comes arise in, in vector odd regressions is that it's easy to be over-parameterized. In the US type data, we all have quarterly data for 50 years. That's about 200 observations. Not too many. And if M is big and P is big, M times P is the number of things on the right-hand side, it's easy to think that least squares estimation of a big model is not going to be well set up. So in the l modern language of econometrics, we say we have to regularize the system. Um, regularize means tighten it up somehow. And um, um, in the early literature where vector auto regressions were, were promoted by Chris Sims, he essentially suggested keeping the dimensionality of the system small. And he didn't really articulate this as a regularization scheme, but I think in the back of his mind, that's what he was thinking of, is that having a small dimensional model is going to be a good approximation. And that's good enough. You don't need to have a big model. Particularly popular in that, um, uh, in the literature promoted by Chris Sims, is the Bayesian vector autoregression methodology, which instead of estimating by least squares, estimates by a Bayesian method, which shrink towards effectively the Minnesota prior. They don't call it the Wisconsin prior or the Danish prior, but the Minnesota prior because Chris used to work at uh, Min University of Minnesota. And um, it's the random walk with drift model, so it shrinks. Um, towards that. This is widely used in empirical practice. Central banks and everyone use it. But there's really no theory, even though it's been around for gosh knows how many years. When I say theory, I mean from the frequentist point of view that tries to understand the sampling properties of estimators. The methods have continued to evolve. There's a recent contribution in review of economics and statistics. And uh, they promote that this is a state of the art of the BVAR universe and uh, provide all the tuning parameters and MATLAB code. You can go and download it and apply it to whatever data set you want. And it does really extremely well in out-of-sample com comparisons. The goal of my project is to focus on uh, combination <coughs> methods, model averaging methods, um, that um, minimize mean square error, as Bates and Granger suggested. And we're focusing on mean, uh, the mean square error of impulse responses. They're going to take Stein type forms, as, as I mentioned, the Stein estimator before. You can also think of them as frequentist model averaging estimators in the style of Gear de Klaskins. Um, effectively, the way they take the form is that they shrink the unrestricted least squares estimator towards uh, parsimonious models. Um, just to specify some math just so that we can see it, the equation of interest as y relates to lags. The error um, has a covariance matrix. Typically, you want to look at a structural shock, so you decompose the variance of the error into um, H times H transpose. Um, that's, I assume, is being done by the researcher. I'm not focusing on a particular structural model. In the empirical work, I'm going to focus on the triangular Koleski de decomposition, but it would work with any other decomposition of the shock. So the epsilons are the shocks of the system, impulse responses are the, are the trace out, response of the variables Y, Due to the shocks. Um, and once again, just to repeat for people who need, who've 
don't work with impulse responses on a daily basis. The impulse response is a change in Y in the future. We call that H steps ahead. H is the impulse response horizon due to a shock today. And so the kind of focus I'm looking at is the effect of monetary shocks. In the United States, we're worried that maybe the uh, Federal Reserve Board might raise interest rates. Um, maybe it's in, in, uh, um, in Europe, we're worried about the central bank, uh, ECB. And uh, what is the effect of a monetary shock? Will prices go up? Will output go down? Will wages go down? What, what are the effects? And we're interested in the horizons. Does this take one year to take place, two years, et cetera? So impulse responses are calculated over a very long period of time, looking at long horizon uh, effects. They're effectively nonlinear functions of the estimated parameters, and therefore their statistical properties are governed by the underlying parameters you've estimated and these complicated nonlinear transformations. Um, so when you come down, I started by saying you have models, and you have a bunch of models. In the context of the vector autoregression, what you don't know is how many lags. Should I have one lag, two lags, ten lags? Which variables? I'm looking at the impact of monetary shock on GDP. Should I include investment and consumption? Should I um, include um, prices? Should I include the number of Twitter comments made by the president? What variable should I have on the right-hand side? You know? um, and so the, there's just different specifications you can use. Um, so what I'm going to be focusing on is on, on a combination of that is that let's uh, combine different VAR lag structures. So just again to fix the math a bit, um, why is the vector that we're trying to calculate the impulse response function? Right on the right hand side, all the coefficients, I call that big coefficient vector, a matrix B. Take the vector of the coefficient B, that's theta, it's a big coefficient vector like least squares estimated um, that you estimate by least squares. But the parameter of interest, the impulse response is beta, is some transformation G of the least squares estimate theta. So the parameter again, B, capital B, is the coefficient to the right hand side. Theta is the full list. Beta is the parameter of interest, which is some sort of transformation. You estimate the model by least squares. You, you start by doing least squares regression, get capital B, list them all as theta, take the transformation, get the impulse response beta. Now, in practice, you don't actually figure out what this function G is. You just go to theta and type bar basic yx. But um, effectively, the end, that's, of course, what's going on, is it's making a transformation of the least squares estimates. To do combination, you have to have a bunch of different models. I'm going to be focusing on models which are vector odd regressions of different orders and s models with fewer variables. In particular, to keep things simple, um, my models with fewer variables are just auto regressions. And that is because in the forecasting environment, simple auto regressions often do extraordinarily well for out of sample forecasting. So my sub models are vo vector auto regressions with one leg, two legs, three legs, up through P legs, and odd regressions with, mo with, um, with legs of one through P. Now, once again, you, you start with a, a list of variables you want to uh, estimate a vector autoregression for, and, and a maximum number of lags. And then I'm going to be using all models with fewer lags and all autoregressions with fewer lags. That in the application I'm going to come through, P is 5, so that gives me 10 models. I could in easily include 100 models or 1,000 models um, in the algebra, it's not really a big deal. The question is what sub-models you want to focus on as being potentially interesting um, uh, for, for your impulse response analysis. And I just haven't, in the application, worked all that out yet. It's a matter of working out the algebra of how to impose constraints for the sub-models. So for now, it's simple, just 10 models, but the hope is to generalize with other subsets. What's important for the math is that each submodel can be written as a linear restriction on the parameters. So theta is the list of all the parameters of the model, and there's some linear restriction on those which generates the submodel. So all these vector autoregressions with fewer parameters, autoregressions are zero constraints on parameters. And so each submodel is a different set of, of zeros. The reasons why that's going to be useful is that for the combination theory, 
um, I want to have explicit expressions. And what's interesting, if you understand least squares methodology, is that um, theta hat is the least squares estimator. Theta hat of R is the estimate from a submodel. One way of estimating a submodel, for example, in autoregression, is just to type regress y on y lag. Another way is to go to the big vector autoregression and, and do a linear transformation of it. So we have estimate from a big model. I can get a submodel by just doing a rotation. And the reason why that's going to be useful is that once I get a distribution theory for the big vector, I can get the distribution for the sub-estimates just by linear projection. And then these are nonlinear transformations. So I'm doing forecast combination or impulse response combination. So I've estimated 10 models. Each one is going to get a weight. I'm going to put weight 1 on the big model, weight 2 on the next model, weight 3, etc. I have 10 weights. My combination estimator then is the weighted average of these estimators. My weights will be positive, they're going to sum to 1. Now we want to get a, a, a way of picking the weights. To pick the weights, I'm going to um, use a distribution theory approach. The distribution theory approach is to say, let's come up with a distribution of this weighted average, and then pick the weights which minimize its mean square error, the mean square error of the asymptotic approximation. Now there's a problem in asymptotic theory that when you impose restrictions that are false, you get omitted variable bias, and that dominates the asymptotic theory. So the way to get around that in distribution theory is to assume that the constraints are almost true, that they're in a root end neighborhood of the truth. That allows the bias and the variance to be of the same order, so neither one dominates the other asymptotically. Um, for people outside econometrics, they often worry about if, if this is metaphysics or psychology or something, and it's not. It's a mathematical trick which allows everything to be relevant in the distribution theory, which is important. So mathematically, the restrictions R prime theta are within a root n neighborhood of being true. The deviations are delta. If delta is big, the restrictions are very bad. If delta is small, the restrictions are close to true. And then we get a distribution theory. The first line says that the least squares estimator is normal. We know that. We teach that to our econometric students in econometrics 101. Least squares estimates are approximately normal. In fact, I'm going to go further than that. I'm going to say that the least squares estimate is a random variable z, which is normal. Or the least squares estimate is asymptotically z, which is normal. The reason why that's useful is that everything is going to be a function of z. The second line says that the impulse response which is a nonlinear function of the least squares, is a, asymptotically is a linear function of the same z. So oftentimes when we teach the delta method, this might be econometrics 2, econometrics 102 instead of econometrics 101, um, you say that the delta method says that uh, nonlinear functions are also asymptotically normal. But it's a, we actually have a stronger result, and it's that it's asymptotically a linear function of the same normal random variable. The third line says that the combination estimator has an asymptotic distribution which can be written as a linear function of the same random variable z and a bias term, where the linear functional and the bias term is a complicated function of the weights. The actual formula is not so important. What's important is the idea that as you put weight on the big model, the bias decreases, but the variance increases. As you put weight on the small models, you get lots of bias, but small variance. So if I was contrasting and estimating impulse response by a vector autoregression with five lags versus an autoregression with one lag, you can see that one's much more precise, but of a biased thing, and the other is much less precise, but without much bias. But this tells you the degree of these two. From this expression, I can calculate the mean square error of the combination estimator. And that's coming up here. I define the um, squared error of the combination estimator for a given set of weights. And then I calculate its expectation. And that is the approximate mean squared error. So the approximate mean squared error 
of a combination estimator of the impulse response. So once again, I have 10 models or 100 models or something. I e use each to estimate an impulse response. I calculate a weighted average of the impulse responses. And then I'm interested in what is the mean square error of that estimator. And it is this expression, which looks pretty nasty. Okay, but the expression has three parts and I can understand what they mean by thinking about it a bit. The first part, I see deltas beginning and ending the first uh, component up on top. That is the squared bias. So the, again, the mean square error of an estimator is typically squared bias plus variance. So the first term is the squared bias, okay? The last term, the trace of a bunch of stuff, that's the variance. So I have a squared bias, I have a variance, and then also I have a term which is minus two times a weighted average of k's. Now, the k's down here is kind of funky looking equation, but what it is effectively has to do with the number of estimated parameters. That term here is like a penalty. It's minus two times the weighted average of effectively the number of estimated parameters. It's very similar to what goes on in the Akaiki information criterion or the Malice criterion for um, model selection. Namely, when you um, look at mean square error things, you end up having a penalty due to the number of estimated parameters. In the context of model selection, the penalty is proportional to two times the number of estimated parameters. In this context, it's related to the average number of estimated parameters from your averaging estimator. So that's what, what it um, is replaced. And then, oh, sorry, um, uh, I want to estimate this mean square error, and I propose an estimator, which involves the estimate of the penalty. So this is a completely feasible estimator, has no tuning parameters. This, this estimator has new, no tuning parameters and is proposed as an estimate of the mean squared error. It's kind of like a Mallow's criterion. Um, and um, here, what I show is that it's asymptotically an unbiased estimator of the mean squared error. So the asymptotic mean squared error. This criterion can be written as a quadratic function of the weight. So once again, what are we doing? I, I, have, a, I have 10 different impulse responses. Take a weighted average for fixed weights, and I've computed the mean squared error, it's a theoretical thing, then an estimate of the mean squared error for a given set of weights, and there it is. It's a quadratic function of the weights. I know how to minimize quadratics. In fact, you probably teach that in not econometrics one, but in high school algebra. Although this is a vector, so you don't typically minimize vectors in high school, but when you take matrix algebra, calculus, you know how to minimize um, quadratic in vectors. The only challenge here is the weights are all positive. So actually you don't use the standard matrix algebra result. Instead, what we do is that we use quadratic programming methods or um, uh, MATLAB minimization um, with a constrained optimization, which is, uses quadratic programming at its heart. So we simply minimize the quadratic subject to the restriction that all the coefficients are positive and sum to one. And so what effectively what's going on once again is that I have estimated 10 models or 100 models. I take weighted average. I figured out the, that the mean square error of the weighted average is a particular quadratic function. And then I find this, the set of weights which minimizes the estimated mean square error subject to the fact that the weights are, should be um, positive and sum to one. When you estimate a bunch of weights this way, it turns out that most models don't get positive weights, only a few do. And the, the algebraic reason for that is you're minimizing a quadratic subject to the restriction that the weights lie on the unit simplex, which is a pointy object. You minimize quadratic subject to, to being on a point, you often end up on one of the, on one of the points. The points are points where um, the edges of, a, of the simplex are model, are weights where you zero out particular models. So typically, um, the solution is a weighted combination of a subset of models. I estimated 10 models, maybe the, the VAR3 gets positive weight, maybe the AR4 gets positive weight, um, but not necessarily all models. Given the weights, you estimate the parameter of interest. In this case, it's the impulse response. Uh, and it's a Stein estimator, effectively. Um, I don't have a good optimality theory for this estimator in the impulse response context, but we do in other contexts. In, in a paper in, um, a, a decade ago, I showed that um, 
under homoscedasticity in linear regression models that averaging ha is asymptotically equivalent to the oracle uh, infeasible best combination. And a few letters, years later, Jeff Racine and I generalized the technique to cross-validation methods so that if you select weights by minimizing cross-validation, you can avoid the homoscedasticity uh, assumption and that the averaging is asymptotically equivalent to the uh, oracle estimator that takes the best combination. Um, in a paper in the Oxford Handbook, um, I focus on sieve regression and show that if you use the cross-validation method, you um, estimate sieve regressions that are asymptotically equivalent to the oracle best uh, combination estimators. Um, in, a, in a paper in quantitative economics, um, I look use local asymptotic theory as I discussed earlier here and show that uh, doing this uh, Mattel's combination dominates the unrestricted estimator uniformly in the parameter space when models are nested and separated by groups of four. And that's kind of a complicated sta statement, but it's the Stein effect. If you shrink, when you shrink, you have to um, shrink at least three coefficients to get a Stein effect. I also have a paper in the Journal of Econometrics which looks at parametric context um, and, and there I show that doing combination dominates the maximum likelihood estimator asymptotically. So they, a lot of people are taught in Econometrics 3, so we talk about Econometrics 1, Econometrics 2, Econometrics 3, in Econometrics 3 you may have been told that maximum likelihood is asymptotically optimal in some sense. Well this theorem says that's wrong, that you can do better by doing shrinkage estimators. You say, how can both one thing be wrong and the other thing wrong? Well, it all depends on the, the way you set up the asymptotic experiment. But um, th this theorem shows that the um, combination estimator uniformly dominates maximum likelihood and um, it achieves a, a local minimax efficiency bound which is stronger than the classic minimax efficiency bound um, which uh, is used to justify uh, maximum likelihood. Um, in 2008, I focused on forecasting and showed that using these methods for forecasting beats least squares. And in a paper um, published a couple years ago with Xu Cheng, we focus on multi step forecasting and, and there we use multi step across validation methods where you leave out blocks of data. Let's um, go on to, to the simulation. Um, so, I have some theory. Now let's see if it actually works. I have um, focused like the, the most of the VAR literature, a seven variable system, 200 observations, five lags. I'm going to compare three methods, least squares, the default BVAR MATLAB code that's on the website um, of the current state of the art, and, my met and the third estimator is mine. I'm going to look at three designs. I'm going to look at different impulse response horizons. I'm going to report the mean square error relative to that of least squares. Numbers less than one are better than least squares. Numbers bigger than one are really bad because they're worse than least squares. Um, this is a heavily parameterized model. 200 observations, 36 regressors. You'd hope you should be able to beat least squares. Um, the first model is just that the data is truly generated by an autoregression. That seems kind of silly for vector autoregressions, but it allows me to focus on the zero correlation properties. Zero correlation is where the, all the action is here. Uh, because as you get closer to the unit root, that's where the BVAR method is designed to work well. So this is a lot of numbers here, but let me kind of walk through the table. I have on the right uh, uh, the columns the different impulse response horizons. Um, impulse horizon 1 through horizon 20. Rows are the degree of persistence in the regressors. Um, top is data is very stationary, AR coefficients 0.5. Bottom's the unit root, coefficients 0.98. For 200 observations, essentially unit root. The theory, by the way, in the paper assumes stationarity. That's why I don't have one listed. Um, the first, so let's look at the first result, the first um, row. It compares the BVAR and Stein. Numbers less than one are beating least squares. The methods beat least squares. And for horizon one, BVAR um, is one third better than least squares, and, and the combination method is, gets half the mean square error, or it's root mean square, or least squares. It's pretty good. But if I go to um, the unit root, if you get the flip uh, response that the BVAR has half the root mean square error of least squares and the Stein method has one third. That's because the BVAR method exploits, it's shrinking towards the unit root, it, it likes the unit root. Okay, 
But um, let's look at the long horizons. If you look at the first uh, row, you see that uh, you get huge benefits from shrinkage at long horizons. In fact, um, the Stein method has um, negligible mean square error relative to mean squares in the very long horizon. And if you look at the unit root, you see um, that nothing much changes in, in, in long horizons. And something very interesting happens. So if you only focus on those two, you'd say, well, it's no big deal. But something very interesting happens at 0.7, or in, in, in between. So that's autoregressive coefficient is 0.7, sample size 200. Those of you who do time series have a feeling for what kind of data that is. Kind of persistent, but not hugely persistent. And what happens here is we see the BVAR method has a root mean square error which is worse than least squares. And the Stein method's doing better. Say, huh, that's weird. And I go to long horizons out to 20 steps ahead, and um, the BVAR is 20 times worse than least squares. That's really bad. That's really, really bad. Um, while the Stein method is uh, 20 times better than least squares. How can it be 20 times worse? Isn't that a computer bug? Well, it turns out what's happening in this context is if you actually look at the individual uh, um, simulation draws, is that half the time one thing happens, half the thing time something else happens. Half the time the results look good. Half the time the BVAR looks weird. What's, what do I mean by that? The BVAR method, it, the estimate is the mode of the posterior, okay? And half the time it's putting the posterior mode right at the prior of a unit root. So it's putting the, the mode right at the multivariate unit, unit root. Now what is the impulse response from the model? The true model at 20 steps ahead is the number 0.7 raised to the power 20. Zero. Very close to zero. The unit root model, the 20 step impulse response is the number one raised to the power 20, which is one. One and zero are very different. And so what's happening is that half the time the BVAR method produces estimates that are so close to a unit root that it's very bad at the long horizon when the unit root is not true. Essentially the method is too aggressive at shrinking towards uh, the unit root. If I change the design um, to a vector autoregression with more complicated correlations, then the same pattern appears, but not as dramatic. <laughs> no. But the same kind of things as in general, the Stein method is doing the best um, everywhere except for at the unit root. So if they're designed, I'm going to use data. So what I do is, I, this is the application used in a lot of the recent papers on vector autoregressions. Take these particular seven variables for the US, estimate it on quarterly data, use the estimated coefficients to pretend this is the true DGP, simulate it, and then do the same exercise. And here I'm going to look at impulse responses clustered by um, variable. And what we see is not too dissimilar from before that in general the Stein method is doing the best. The VBAR method can be doing significantly worse than least squares, but in general also the, um, the Stein method is not doing that much better than least squares. I think it's because the data look very much like a random walk, um, and so it, um, it's hard to beat it uh, by the Stein method. Although it's surprising how badly the uh, VBAR method does in many cases. Finally, let me show you um, some actual numbers. So when we do econometrics, um, we can evaluate the quality of methods by theory, but most often those theories involve approximations, such as large sample approximations. We can evaluate things in Monte Carlo simulations where we control the truth. Um, but when I show you applications, I can't tell you what's better and what's worse. All, all I can say is it's different. So we have to be honest about that, right? Um, but here are the variables. I'm going to look at, at impulse responses due to a monetary shock. Um, this is a variable system. There's 49 impulse responses, right? So I'm not going to show you all 49. I'm only going to show you three or four. And so I'm going to look at um, impulse responses due to monetary shock, meaning the Fed funds rate change. And then, um, actually, I'm not going to look at point forecasts here. And I'm only going to look at a, a, at a few impulse responses since a lot of them have similar shapes. Um, so this first plot is the impulse response 
um, of US real GDP due to a Fed front shock. So what's a Fed front shock? One day the Fed funds get excited, they wake up, they hold a conference call, they say, hey, um, this Fed front, it's the um, Board of Governors, the uh, Open Market Committee, they say, hey, let's raise the interest rates. Uh, the markets aren't expecting it, wouldn't that be cool? And um, well, probably they saw that there's need to do that. So they raised the interest rates and um, immediately what happens in the world is it's traced out from quarters, four quarters is one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, what's the effect on US GDP is it falls. So we kind of teach in basic intermediate macro, right? So what you see here is plots of three estimates. The least squares estimate are the circles, the B bar estimates are the crosses, and the stars are my new method. Here are the distinctions we see between the methods. Short horizons, they line up very nicely, and this is pretty generic. They, they line up very similar on short horizons. They differ typically at the longer horizons. Second thing you notice is that the, B, the method typically is in between the other two methods in terms of the point forecast. The third thing you notice is the BVAR method tends to flatten out. That's a unit root. Unit root means that shocks have permanent effects. The least squares method tends to be stationary and the Stein method tends to shrink towards, uh, be similar to the um, stationary estimate. That's GDP. So once again, interest rates go up, GDP falls, but we also can see how it's traced out over time. Second thing, this is the um, effect on price level. So um, Janet Yellen raises the interest rate. Um, I go out to Starbucks to buy a coffee and they say um, it's another 25 cents. So the prices have gone up. But what are the difference across the estimators? The estimators say short horizons, practically up to a year and a half, very similar estimates. Very similar estimates in impulse response. The differences are at the long horizons. Here the, the least squares estimate is the most different. Um, and and uh, here the Stein estimator is closer to the VVAR estimate. My third um, impulse response is, to be, is investment. Interest rates go up, investment falls. Now we know that, but what's more important is the magnitude by which it falls. Notice that the numbers are much higher than that of GDP. The impact um, of interest rates on GDP are much more substantial. Not too much unlike what I think are taught in macro classes. Again, at the short horizons, the estimates are very similar. The long horizon, they're very different. Here, the um, the BVAR method is telling you there's a unit root story, there's a long-term impact of interest rate changes. Um, the other models are telling you that it, it dies off in the long term. And this final picture is the response of hours worked, which is a measure of, of employment in the economy. And once again, you see the estimates are very similar at the short horizons, very different at the long horizons. Permanent effect, according to the BVAR method, uh, more of a temporary effect according to the, the Stein estimate. Another thing which is interesting about the combination method is um, you can actually look at, at the weights and, and say what models were useful. <coughs> I estimated 10 models. What I'm plotting here is the weights by impulse horizon. I didn't focus on this too much, but I'm estimating the weights separately for each impulse response horizon. And what's happening is you see that there's one model, the box, which gets about 70% of the weight at all impulse response horizons, and that's the kitchen sink, the VAR with five legs. The impulse response likes putting lots of weight on the VAR5. The impulse responses don't like it when you have bias, and so it turns out to want to do that. At long horizons, it also likes, wants to put second most weight on the VAR3, but at short horizons, it likes the autoregressive model. So this is telling you the different models and how, what, what comes up um, that, that it likes. Um, I also did a similar calculation for forecast combination. So that was, the first was impulse responses. This is for forecast combination. I do the forecast combination separately by variable. This is for forecasting GDP. Suppose I wanted to forecast GDP one year out, two years out, three years out, and um, what models would I use? This tells you that at the very short horizons, the, star, the diamond model, VAR2, is the, best, is, is the best thing to use. Put 60% of the weight on that model, 
but for eight steps ahead, don't use it for two years out. Again, at short horizons, you want to use um, put 20% on the VAR4 and 20% on an autoregressive model. But at the very long horizon, if I want to forecast out three years, it says just use two models. Use the odd regression and use the VAR3 and, put, and take an, essentially an equal weight of those two. So the forecast combination says um, lean towards the small models relative to impulse responses. Impulse responses, it cares more about bias. Put the weight on the big model. Forecasting, it says put the weight on the small model. And it depends on the forecast horizon. So just to conclude here, um, what I want to emphasize is that combination or averaging is underutilized in economics. There's a kind of a growth industry in the stats literature about theory for this, but um, it's underutilized in practical economics. Uh, averages, going back to portfolio optimization theory, we know they have smaller risk than single estimators. What we do know right now is have a fairly decent theory about how to select the weights to reduce MSE. We have some asymptotic optimality results. We have some distributional results. What we don't understand are a bunch of stuff, too. For example, we don't really understand much about inference. After you do this model combination, it's hard to do inference. It's a really hard problem. In general, how do we go beyond point estimation? How can we combine distributions? It's hard. Um, this forecast combination and model averaging is focusing on trying to get the best point, but is there actually information in the heterogeneity, in, in the fact that the estimates may be very different in, in the spread of the forecast? Could we use this in some way to get a measure of uncertainty? These are things which we don't really understand, or at least I don't understand. Um, and so, um, I'm out of time. <laughs>